Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Accelerating Value and Innovation in Energy and Utilities with Data and AI. I'm Michael Silber, the Event Director for Inlit Australia, and we are excited to be bringing you this event today uh, along with Databricks. As a little bit of a preamble, uh, gone are uh, the days that data scientists and analytics optimize business performance in the back office. Today, data science and analytics can create a closed loop of control of infrastructure and production systems. And with the pro progress of technology-driven pursuit of sustainability, the energy sector is able to address the challenges corporations are facing to better integrate their broad ESG objectives into their daily operations. And uh, during today's discussion, we'll be touching on a number of critical topics, and these include how the energy industry is being transformed by AI today, how digitalization is improving project economics and streamlining operations with AI, why data is key to sustainable growth, the role of AI and data science in achieving ESG goals, and the need for organizational transformation to meet the changing customer needs. Um, I should note, if you have any questions for our speakers today, uh, and I'm sure you will, please type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen, and they'll be addressed in the final uh, segment of today's session. Uh, and now, before handing it over to our two expert speakers, um, I want to remind everyone about the return to in-person events after two years of only digital-only efforts. Uh, Inlet Australia will be one of the industry's first live events in nearly three years. 16th and 17th of March in Melbourne. And we're excited about a world-class roster of speakers and the participation as sponsors and exhibitors of some of the most important companies in the business. Promises to be lively, vibrant, and, first, and a first-class networking event. And of course, Databricks is a major participant in this event. Look forward to seeing you there. And now, uh, without any further discussion from me, I want to introduce you to our uh, two speakers today. Rayshawn Tulsi, who's the Solutions Architect, Strategy and Energy at Databricks, and Bede Hackney, who's the Regional VP at Databricks for Australia and New Zealand. So, gentlemen, I'll turn it over to you, and I know Rayshawn uh, is the uh, going to begin kick this off, so over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Michael. Second, I'm going to share this. Fantastic. Can you guys see my screen? We can now, mate. Cheers, mate. Yeah, my name is uh, Roshan Tulsi. I'm a solutions architect, but I'm also a subject um, matter expert in uh, energy. I spent 14 years working in uh, the petroleum industry, but I also work with renewable energies, utilities, um, and you know, energy and transition. And I work with most of our global customers in energy, some of our local customers, domestic and international. Uh, ISDs and vendors, and really I want to share some perspectives that we're seeing in the industry. Maybe it'll resonate with you, and I'm also looking for feedback as to you know, how we can better work with you. So I thought one good way is to start with um, this little quote um, from a Swedish uh, CEO and an inventor of the battery. It's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool thing to be able to say, to invent a battery. And it says energy is personal, and I love this sign because actually, if you think about it, it's one of the only kind of industries or verticals or kind of like subject matter or domain that really is very personal. We can produce energy, we consume energy, we are retailers of it, we, uh, it is necessary, it is in every single aspect of our life. Um, we'll be very challenged to live and work and commute and do interesting things in this world without energy in some way. So therefore energy is very personal. And hence the changes that we make to it as vendors, as technology providers, as consumers and customers is very personal. So hence, from a very personal perspective, I want to help reduce costs for usage because that becomes very personal. But I also want to help you, you know, come overcome some of these challenges. Uh, decarbonization is one of them, cost is another, health and safety is paramount. This is something very important to myself and hence energy is personal. And in order for us to kind of take on that challenge, we see ourselves as customers. When we talk about customers and energy, it is ourselves. But we are all part of this connected energy ecosystem. And it really is a connected ecosystem, more so now than ever before, because the challenges we are seeing to the industry, whether it's renewables, utilities, oil and gas, the lines are relatively blurry. We all need to consume energy. And there's challenges we are seeing in the world. We are seeing um, a rise in demand for clean, sustainable energy. And that's a good thing. 
but then the infrastructure in place globally isn't there to support it. For example, we all, there's a rise in electric vehicles and that's fantastic, but then the cost for powering those vehicles on national grids will be more challenging. So we need, we need better infrastructure to manage that and the cost to manage that and the time at which you can charge it that makes it viable. Right. Also producing these vehicles, there's some challenges around them. How do you make that economically and environmentally sustainable? Right. So these, these are good things. And there's an ecosystem that works together. It's regulatory, the service companies, there's technology providers. They all work in this like relatively collaborative, sometimes competitive, or a collaboratively competitive environment where we are the center as customers. Now, I work for Databricks, and Databricks is a data and AI company. Um, but we also see that sustainability is also a data and AI challenge. And I really wanted to kind of highlight this, this fact around sustainability and ESG because these two terms are used interchangeably and, and I wanted to bring it up here very quickly. So we see sustainability as kind of like broad, a framework in order for you to address your, your environmental and your decarbonization challenges. And ESG, which is environmental, sustainable and governance, are the metrics you use to measure that in order for you to achieve your sustainability. I once presented at a conference in, in Dallas last year and it was like a, an hour presentation and we said ESG a lot and then at the end I put up my hand and said, does anyone know what ESG is? And no one picked up their hand. So it's very important to kind of highlight these kind of topics. And, you know, we use acronyms all the time and we, we fail to understand that sometimes this isn't common vernacular with most people. Okay. But what are some of the challenges we've seen? Um, and the main challenge was that this idea of sustainability in ESG has always been a very corporate concept. and Really, we want to be working with uh, the operations, the uh, plant providers, the utility providers down, downstream or midstream. And we can kind of solve this problem by making your sustainability goals the same as your operational goals. This kind of like site to suite gap in sustainability. And it is possible. And we do that by kind of first going back to our core strength, which is our platform. Um, we create a platform, and I think Bede will kind of go into as to what this Delta Lake really is, this uh, uh, data lake. Uh, and we, you know, data has been kind of transforming over, over, over the time. And we started with, um, you know, this concept of a data lake, and it was really strong, and it had good governance, and it was fantastic what it was, but it wasn't scalable. And the way as data changed over time by bringing in metadata, video, different types of data, especially unstructured data, it's important, uh, these data lakes were not performed in that. So the concept of a, a Delta uh, Lake showed up, which is more flexible and scalable, and uh, really it was all around, I mean, I mean this data lake, which is really all around, you know, dealing with large volumes of data, unstructured data, different types, but it lacks the security of kind of these data warehousing techniques. And really what we did was take the best of both worlds and we created a lake house, a single platform to take in different types of data, data sources, unstructured, structured data, scalable, it's unscalable, you can bring it up and bring it down, basically you need a single place to do machine learning, to do your business insights and do your SQL analytics, a place for data scientists, business insights, all be generated in the same place. With a single platform, you can kind of take on these challenges. Right? And what's important here is in order for you to take on sustainability challenges, you, you're not gonna achieve that in the first round. It's a process, it's an iterative process, my advice would be is to start small, take on one use case, grow that, collect the data, build the insights, take the same insights, re-inject it back into the operations, and then build transparency around it, build investment, and then have an action plan. And we see that across this kind of like maturity curve for our customers. We start with the aggregation, where we're collecting the data and we're building the insights around it. And then we start doing the analytics on that. And the same time, it's the same circle. Exactly the same circle of collecting data, giving transparency, maturity, and then reinvesting back into the operations. And then, of course, there's an action plan that, that follows on it. So what we want to do is, is actually is take ESG with sustainable framework and actually make it operational so that your operational needs are the same as your uh, production needs and same as your sustainable needs. So you don't have to necessarily solve a scope one, scope two ESG target what you could do is solve an operational target, and as a consequence, you will see your scope one and scope two actually change. And we'll look into an example in the later section of this panel. That's the one of this. So the question is, why do I need a lake house type structure for ESG? Well, because 80% of your ESG data is unstructured. So you need a platform for you to collect that data, process it, and work with it. Um, I thought I'll quickly include, uh, I think I have a minute or two left, some 
forces that are driving uh, industry and changes in it really is really around competition. There's different types of energy. We compete amongst ourselves, we compete between different utility providers, different types of energy. So we're here to help you um, have a better customer 360 viewpoint, help you reduce costs. Put the customer, which is us, again, myself, personally, at the center of that action. How do I personally reduce my cost? And this is one way to do that. Um, and in order to do that, you have to go to operational AI, automation, look at, look at AI, look at looking at techniques like proactive maintenance, real-time anomaly detection, again, collecting data, building insights, and then pushing into automation. And then finally, it's the perception, the reporting around ESG, improving health and safety, and then fundamentally achieving your carbon neutrality. And this is a quick kind of introduction, and we'll get into the panel, and I'd love some feedback on this, some pushback, some comments, some compliments, some challenges, I'll take more. With that, I'm going to hand over to B. So thank you. Well, I think we're going to jump into a panel discussion now, Michael. Is that right? Although I have That's to say, Roshi, I'm, I've never tried. I've never tried the approach of asking for compliments um, at the same time as questions. I'm going to do that from now on. Thank you for that tip. That's awesome. Well, Roshi, you uh, you deserve uh, uh, certainly compliments on that. And uh, uh, to to begin this panel discussion. Uh, I want to ask uh, Ration if he comes back on the screen. Uh, I'd like to ask him a question very specifically um, about the ESG in energy. Looks like Ration may have dropped. We're having maybe some internet challenges. So why don't uh, so while well, we're waiting for uh, Ration to come back up, why don't we uh, be? Let me ask you something about um, where do we start with all of this? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question. Um, where do you start? Where do you and and I, I presume and if I if I sort of shape the question, where do we start in a data and AI journey? I guess maybe is the right way to take the question. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, yeah, that's a, it, from a kind of a big a broad perspective. I think would work here. Yeah, um, and and so I guess there's a couple of areas. The first thing I would say is that you know we work with hundreds of customers in Australia. We work with thousands of customers globally. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of our local energy sector um, customers, but one of the really common, there's a handful of common themes that come out um, across the, the customers in that cohort that we work with who are most successful. Um, and so one of them is that they pick off quick wins. And so when, you know, I think most organizations today recognize that um, that they need to leverage data and AI to um, empower transformation and to drive growth and better decision making um, and, you know, be able to make real time decisions as well. Um, and so most organizations recognize that, but a lot of organizations start down this journey of, you know, spending a year or multiple years setting up a data foundation and they, they really focus on getting um, that, that foundational layer right before they start to deliver, you know, value out of machine learning or AI. Um, I, I would suggest that oh, clearly the foundation is super important, but the customers that we work with who have the most um, momentum in their digital strategy are the ones who identify sort of the quick wins um, and look to look to deliver outcomes in sort of weeks or months rather than, you know, the sort of traditional years approach, right? And so I guess my advice, if, if um, people on the, um, on the session today are looking to kind of where do we start or how do we get momentum into our um, digital strategy, my advice would be pick a use case, um, pick something that the business cares about. That's another, another area where we see customers going wrong is that, you know, the use cases that they invest in happen to be the ones that the data scientists find interesting, um, maybe more so than the ones where the business sees genuine um, business value. And so, um, pick a use case, check with the business that that use case has, you know, real measurable value. Um, and then just and then just focus on delivering that use case. I'm going to talk um, a little bit later in the session today. I'm going to talk about um, a capability that we've um, brought to market we call solutions accelerators, where, you know, we're trying to get customers from idea through to production in sort of six weeks. That's a, That's the goal that we set ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, my first my first answer to where do you start on a data and AI journey would be um, pick a use case, make it something that the business cares about, and and try and kick some goals early. Um, and you know, success begets success. Um, and so that's that's kind of one answer. The other, and I'll, I'll touch really briefly. The other answer is, you know, I think um, in Australia particularly, but globally, there's a skills shortage when it comes to data and AI teams. Um, and so 
you know, obviously pick platforms that you think are going to make your team super productive, but also invest in education and enablement because um, it's a statement of fact that none of us are going to be able to fulfill our data teams um, with as many high quality folks as we would like. Uh, and so, you know, as much as hiring is part of the answer, you can, we all need to um, build some of our own experts. Hey, Rasheen, I, I see that you're back, mate. I don't know if you want to jump in on that question or if, uh, if you've got any perspective. Uh, yeah, I think what's important there is, and yeah, apologies for, for dropping out. Again, another question for sustainable energy. There we go. Uh, who knows what, what caused that? Um, what, I think you highlighted a really important point, which is really around, and we say this with humility, we don't have all the data skills, and we'd love to hire people uh, within our organization, but they may not be ramped up in time to solve that immediate problem. And this is why ecosystems are important. The skill sets do exist. This is why partnering and collaborating outside and uh, is very important. You can work with an ISV, you can work with a larger provider, you can work, work with us, you can work with even our competition on, on some aspects of it, right? You, we are here to help you solve problems and a platform that allows it, that's open, that allows this kind of interaction, this collaboration, it's one that'll help you succeed more than one that's kind of closed off. And that's really where we, should, we can go with this, right? Open platforms and collaboration and ecosystems are the way to go. I think the ecosystem point's a great point. Sorry, Michael. No, that's quite all right. Uh, thanks. Welcome back, Ration. Hey, um, can I say we're getting a great shot of that car behind you, and it looks like it might be a DeLorean. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, move a little bit so you're fully on screen. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. other way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing your cyber truck there, mate. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a, it's a little two-year wait for that one. Yeah. And I'm very, very impressed. Um, uh, I want to remind our audience, please uh, type in your questions, uh, type them in as we go along, as you think of them, and we'll get to them in the uh, final segment here. Hey, I want to, that was a great uh, opening presentation, uh, Ration, and I'd like to ask you, could you speak specifically about ESG and energy? Yes, I can. So there's a few kind of like topics we can, we can go on, right? And I think what would be really good is, let's take an example, right? And what B kind of spoke about also applies here is, don't try and solve large problems immediately. You'll run into you know, many challenges. Start small, but have a platform that allows you to scale up on those problems. Right? So, so here's one. Right? Um, you want to reduce potentially your carbon footprint by about 20%. Right? And it's an operational problem. And I was working with a customer in, um, in, ca in Canada. So you know, it's a very cold environment. And, uh, and really what we were trying to do was, is actually build AI insights around the down, the downhole operational equipment. So we put some, um, we were looking at them and building machine learning insights on them. Right? And what we found was that even before we got to building these like proactive or predictive maintenance, their data science teams could actually see the trends of how the equipment is functioning. So they could make, you know, relatively intelligent guesstimates as to like, when they should actually perform maintenance versus doing time-based maintenance on that. So they were migrating slowly towards condition-based maintenance. And what that was doing was, was actually saving them on when they could send a field crew out to improve on that or to make those changes. Now, traveling in dangerous environments means you're reducing the, you know, there's risk of hazardous scenarios, and, you know, catastrophic scenarios like car accidents, transportation. Well, if you aren't traveling out to actually solve these problems because they aren't really failing enough, then you've impacted that straight away. So you aren't traveling out, you reduce your health and safety costs. You also reduce your carbon footprint for just consuming you know, fuel to get out there. Your crew is happier if they can do remote management of that, uh, especially now in living in, you know, in a post-pre-COVID post COVID for life world, you know, call it that. Um, and you're still collecting insights. And then eventually you'll migrate to full automation over time, but you have to start somewhere. And what you found was that immediately we reduced our uh, scope one impact because equipment wasn't failing as much, we didn't have to have supply chain equipment ready for that. So your supply chain and actually then also decreased. Then the production of that equipment wasn't necessary. So you didn't have to overproduce equipment or store it in inventory. The transportation globally around the world for that piece of equipment that wasn't being uh, overutilized was also reduced. So that impact, that footprint was impact. At the same time, because the operation was running more productively, you were more performant, more productive using AI, and the same, and you hit your scope one and then your scope two ESG targets. So that's really where we're trying to bring into. So use data, use insights, collect the operations, mm -hmm. focus on operations, and you'll see your ESG metrics actually decline. And decline you, over time. you know, I'd love to jump in on that. I think, um, you know, and, and so predictive maintenance uh, clearly has a, a huge 
um, opportunity or represents a huge opportunity for energy sector um, organizations, obviously, and um, production and supply are the, the most obvious examples of that. You know, I, um, I love some of those use cases. And so while they have great opportunity for ESG, I'm also seeing, you know, just huge business value. One of the, actually, one of the examples um, here in Australia, it's not the energy sector, but it is related. So Downer Engineering run the Watara, um, Waratah, sorry, Waratah train line here in Sydney, in, in New South Wales. And uh, just a great example, they had a um, they had a battery that powered the air conditioning in every carriage. Um, battery cost $200,000 per battery, so it's a reasonable battery, um, but it wasn't designed for Australian weather conditions. And so there was a certain set of weather conditions um, during summer where the battery would reach what they referred to lovingly as a thermal meltdown, um, which not only Re resulted in a um, two hundred thousand dollar battery being um, wasted, um, but it also represented a passenger risk. And so those guys moved from scheduled maintenance to predictive maintenance, and they were able to identify the indicators of this thermal meltdown and actually deploy a maintenance crew who would who would jump on the train at a at a train station, um, disconnect that particular battery, and uh, and tag it for for maintenance. And so there was no impact to the no impact to the train. Um, no impact to the service, but they were saving themselves a two hundred thousand dollar bill and the uh, and a sneaky blowing up issue. Um, and so, yeah, I think like obviously there's huge benefits from an ESG standpoint, but I think there's also really measurable um, business value outcomes when you talk about predictive maintenance in particular. Sorry to jump in, Michael. No, no, I think that, so. That's exactly right. And if you go back to your train example, if they had still maintained time based maintenance, they probably had to shut down. The, the train itself to do the maintenance. So that's disruption to service, angry customers, delays, you have to go through the wrong process. And if you can still maintain the high quality of service and reduce on time-based maintenance, you've got happier customers and you have higher production going on. So yeah, so these are things to look for. And I would say like, you don't have to necessarily target ESG objectives only. If you tie them to operations, you can link them together because you have to build business value to actually justify some of the spend. Um, by the way, don't need to apologize. This is a discussion. Jump in wherever you see uh, where you feel you can make an appropriate comment, which I'm sure is all the time. Uh, let me uh, switch gears a little bit and go, um, Bead, maybe you can kick this one off. Uh, talk a little bit about the rising role of tech in energy, um, uh, particularly AI and, and the role of data. Uh, yeah, I can. And I think it's interesting, right? Like, so. I think there's a role, rising role of data and AI in every sector. You know, um, energy. So, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this later as well. The energy sector in Australia is clearly um, undergoing some disruption. There's clearly new entrants, um, but you know, every sector um, is undergoing disruption. And and I think you know, certainly at Databricks, we believe that there's a an increasing role for data and AI. You know, in every sector. Um, and so I don't think it's particularly unique to energy, but but if you actually if you look at it, um, you know what what are what are the things we need to do? Well, we need to make better decisions, right? You know, where um, in most or, most organisations are experiencing, you know, increased competition from you know new market entrants, um, or looking to looking to um, reduce costs to increase profitability, um, looking to make better decisions. You know, I think um, you know where. It, Organizations are maturing, and we're used to making decisions based on our analytics. Um, but you know, we're increasingly expecting a higher caliber of decision out of our out of our analytics. And so, I think um, I think modern data architecture or modern data platforms, you know, the role really is enable better real time decisioning, better and real time. Um, and so, I don't, I don't I don't know that it's particularly special for the energy sector, but I think there's a, a million examples. Um, you know, 5MS in Australia is a great example of, you know, the entire industry trying to be more real time, right? Moving, you know, it's a $16 billion industry, moving, moving it from 30 minute settlements to five minute settlement, you know, in theory, that's going to make renewable energy more competitive. So there's um, some environmental benefit there as well. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think every sector, um, you know, we're trying to make better decisions more real time. And I think that's super true in energy. Um, Roshin, I don't know if you want to jump in there. Yeah, I'm going to jump in there because actually what you said was kind of interesting. And then I'm going to say this right. So um, it's who are the customers and who are making the decisions. And in the energy vertical, in the energy sector, since I would say we are the customers, 
we if you can empower like the providers the utility generators and the downstream customers like ourselves access to the data you can make very in interesting decisions so you can create self self-service portals so that customers can actually see and have real-time streaming information of their data but let's say we want to be more economical um the rise of solar so if you're living in a, a lovely part of the world like australia where you have you blessed with lots of sunlight solar should be part of your decision making you may want to install solar but you have to think like well like how can i be smart about how am i selling the energy back into the grid well if the data is available in real time you can make very good economical decisions as to like when you can shut down certain services on your home so that you can then push more energy back into the grid let's assume you're out you know you're out somewhere maybe enjoying enjoying a sunday somewhere you can shut down most of the services in your home and push that energy back into the grid or if you're vacationing somewhere right or if you actually you know you've gone back to work and things so the more control you have over your data uh the more the better your decisions can be even from a very personal level so customers and the clients absolutely but also yourself as a customer great point. yeah uh, uh Rachel, that makes me uh, uh kind of circles me back to one of the points you were making in your opening there which uh, hopefully you can elaborate on and i love this phrase i do it's that energy is personal um can you can we talk a little bit more about what that means and uh, and how uh, what that uh, it did kind of flesh that out a little bit more if you don't mind yeah, I mean, like, that's a nice, like, you know, like tagline in an elevator. Now that I've got caught out and I have to kind of go into it. So the elevator ride is over. Exactly. Well, let's look at uh, us as a, let's look at the same example of solar. That's a really good example because it's, is bi-directional energy flow, the cost for that, is that fair, uh, fair pricing for the home user? Like, and also at the retail level, is that it, can they create an economically viable model that's also allowed to create the better cost to serve for the consumer? So it both works. So that's a good thing because on a personal level, cost is very important for us to mitigate, you know, risk in our life and, and also enjoy certain things in our life. But then, you know, what is the environmental impact to community? So again, very personal. So as we impose these like new technology and new, new, new instruments and stuff, is what we're doing sustainable? Is, what's the impact of local communities? Uh, are we generating uh, opportunities in that community so that we can, you know, benefit from? So that's that's really what I meant by energy being personal, right? We produce it, we consume it. It's directly tied to every aspect of our life. Indeed. Pete, anything you uh, want to add to that? No, I think uh, no, I think Russian's covered it. I think it's super interesting that you start to think about um, you start to think about leveraging data and AI in your own home um, in terms of the way that you might save data, or save power, I should say. I think that's super interesting, but I'm sure we can all relate to that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, folks, who are, I know we have a good audience online because I I see the numbers, so please uh, submit your questions. Uh, we'll get to them. Uh, but I want to turn it over to Bede for a few minutes. He's going to talk a bit about creating and accelerating value with data and AI. Uh, Bede? Yeah, thank you. Let me, I've got, uh, let me share my screen, hopefully. Bear with me, folks. Can I just get confirmation you can see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. There you go. Um, awesome. Okay, so so look, I guess let me jump straight in, uh, assuming that the there we go. Um, and so I probably won't spend a lot of time on this, but I did um, I did just want to I guess remake the point that you know we're seeing disruption disruption in every sector globally, um, but today is an energy sector um, specific event, and we're focused in Australia and New Zealand. And you know you can see a handful of examples of um, disruption uh, and and events that are happening uh, in Australia and New Zealand. You know I think a couple that aren't on the slide that I love. You know I love um, examples of new entrants. So Telstra becoming a, a retail energy um, provider is uh, a great example of a new entrant that I think has the potential to pr create some disruption. You know I guess going in the other way, in the other direction, AGL becoming a car leasing company. Um, is also a super interesting um, example, but we've, we've probably talked about it. And so I'll, I'll click on and just share this slide with the audience. And so um, a bunch of brands that you probably recognize from here in Australia and, and global organizations as well. These are all organizations that we at Databricks are working with today um, to help them um, get value out of data and AI. 
And so whether it's um, vegetation management through to customer lifetime value or whether it's better forecasting, um, you know, I talked about five minute settlement, um, which is something that we're hoping with AMO. You know, AMO will tell you that um, Databricks is the platform and you can find a number of articles online about this, but you will tell you that um, Databricks is the platform that helps them help them move from five minute settlement, sorry, from 30 minute settlement down to five minutes. Um, you know, we we're also working with them on their forecasting, demand forecasting. And so um, we've taken the processing time down by over 80%. It was, it was over a day. In fact, it was over 30 hours. And we're helping them um, get that down into a manageable, manageable time frame so that they can make um, more real-time decisions. A couple of other great examples. Um, Osnet are actually uh, a public reference for Databricks. In fact, you can find a case study about how Osnet are using Databricks on our website. Um, in the case study, they talk about uh, three times faster data processing um, at half the price, which um, sounds pretty helpful both in terms of um, real-time decisions and cost management. Um, but they also talk about, and I, fi I find this interesting, they also talk about um, decreasing operational overhead by 20 or 30%. And if you unpack that, you know, if we can make our data teams 20 or 30% more productive, um, then, you know, I think we can you know, that making our data teams more productive has a clear part to play uh, in solving the skills shortage that we see um, that we see across the industry. Um, another great, in fact, the last example, but another great example, Mercury. And I think um, perhaps Brian from Mercury might be in the in the audience today, uh, and so we might jump on the Q and A if I misstate it. But um, Brian presented at a recent Databricks event and talked about um, how they were using Databricks to create a consolidated platform for data. And actually creating a self-service culture, which you know Michael touched on earlier um, in his opening as, as part of the outcome here or part of the answer. But interestingly, um, the folks at Mercury talk about leveraging that platform to um, attract top talent as well. And so lots of great examples about um, how we're um, helping energy sector organizations in this part of the world um, create value using data and AI. Um, I thought I would just really quickly share this um, share this example on the screen because it's a little bit visual. And so this is a customer um, where their challenge was optimizing their wind turbine ac asset performance and uptime. Um, and so they wanted to address that using machine learning. And you can see, for those of you in the audience who are perhaps um, a little more technical, you can see on the left-hand side um, a super high-level uh, architecture design in terms of how we approached solving that problem with the Databricks Lake House. Um, we're obviously, and you can tell from the di diagram that we're obviously working pretty closely um, with the Azure um, team at Microsoft to deliver this particular solution. Um, but the outcome, the outcome here, and, and super happy to drill into the details of the architecture, maybe offline if anyone's interested, but um, what we were able to do with this customer is create an IoT pipeline where we we're able to bring that data in in real time. And that did two things. The thing you can't see um, is that it created um, an analytics pipeline that supported machine learning and artificial intelligence use cases. And, you know, that's back to, if we think about wind turbines, that's back to doing things like predictive maintenance. Um, it's back to doing things like um, optimizing the performance of that, um, of that asset. Um, but the real time, uh, or the, sorry, the visual thing that you can see on the right hand side is we we're also able to deliver um, real-time visualization so that analysts could um, could explore uh, opportunities for optimization um, in real time in a platform that was obviously graphical and something they were comfortable using. And so I'll kind of I'll move on really quickly because you know I'd really love to get to some Q and A, but you know all of those customers that I've just talked about, um, and frankly all of our seven thousand customers around the world, really what they're doing is they're bringing what most customers and particularly energy sector organizations have, which is massive amounts of data. Um, and they're leveraging machine learning and analytics to try and unlock um, business value and make better decisions. Um, and so I thought I would just, in, in literally one slide, and I'm doing it no value at all, but I thought I would just give um, a slightly deeper dive on um, how the Databricks platform works. And again, I'm really happy to answer any questions live or, or have some follow-up sessions if it's interesting. Um, but Roisin introduced um, what we call the lake house paradigm, which is that um, balance of um, you know, everything we love about a data warehouse and everything we love about a data lake um, delivered in a single platform. But just to kind of double click on that a little bit further, 
And so the Databricks platform, it's delivered as a service. It's, um, it's a managed service delivered from the public cloud. And that's um, super important because, you know, back to our skills shortage, you know, do we want our data scientists managing patching TensorFlow and um, the latest machine learning um, packages, or do we want our data scientists doing data science? You know, our view is that we can deliver a managed platform that maximizes their productivity. Um, we deliver it, and if I work from sort of the bottom up, we deliver that platform off any of the three public clouds. It's locally available um, here in Australia uh, and in New Zealand. So we think we've got the data sovereignty challenge um, handled. You know, and something we've talked about a lot is that, that if a single lake house platform, one of the important differentiators is that we can bring all of your data into that platform. And so we can bring, you know, the unstructured and real time data um, that we would traditionally bring into a data lake. Um, we can bring that into the same platform that also has um, all of our structured data that might traditionally reside in a data warehouse. And so every member of our data team can work off all of the available data and the same sort of single source of truth. Um, and I think that's super important in every sector, but I think um, unstructured and streaming data has a really significant part to play in um, in the energy sector, I think the wind turbine management um, use case that I just touched on is a great example of where streaming data has a part to play. You know, I talked about vegetation management, which is um, super interesting for um, energy suppliers. Um, and you know, clearly unstructured data and you know, photo data and satellite imagery has a has a really significant part to play in that type of use case. But obviously, our structured data, um, you know, continues to be how the business is used to operating, and so. Um, we can bring all of the all of that data um, into a single environment. We layer, and I won't touch on this too deeply, but we layer data management and governance across the top of all of that data, um, which is really important in a regulated industry. Um, but then, um, super importantly, on top of that, what we do is we create different persona-based interfaces into the platform. And so, one of the big problems we've had a couple of big problems we've had in data and AI in the past. You know, firstly, our data was siloed. You know, we had some data in a data lake and we had some in a data warehouse. And, you know, we think the lake house sort of solves that silo. But another problem we've had is that our data teams are siloed. You know, data engineers typically don't like or talk to data scientists who don't like or talk to business analysts. Um, and so that results in those sort of three key um, constituents of our, of our data team. Um, really acting quite independently. And so, you know, in the Lakehouse platform, what we've done is we've created a, a dedicated interface for your data engineers with all of the tools and visualizations that they're um, used to working with. Then we've created yet another standalone dedicated interface for, um, for data scientists, which has all of their um, machine learning packages preloaded and all of the sort of R and Python and Scala programming languages that they're used to operating in um, made available for them. And then and then separately, um, another interface into the single platform um, for our business analysts, which is purely a SQL and visually driven um, interface. But And so persona built dedicated interfaces, but all linking into a single platform. And so, you know, we've delivered for the end user or the, the member of your data team an interface that they're comfortable and, um, and you know, happy to execute within. Um, but we've managed on the back end to bring that into a single platform so we can drive um, we can drive better collaboration. And so I probably um, I'll probably finish up on this slide. Um, you know we touched Michael, you asked the question earlier, where do we start? Um, you know I, I think I mentioned really briefly um, the solutions accelerators that we've um, that we've developed. and so I, I'm certainly not going to go through the detail on the slide here, but at a at a high level, you know we have um, you know, hundreds of customers in Australia, thousands of customers around the world, um, and, and hundreds of customers in the energy sector. Um, those customers are by and large wanting to do similar things. And so, you know, we've touched on predictive maintenance or preventative or predictive maintenance quite a few times today. You know, that's a super common use case in energy, right? And so what we identified at Databricks is that, you know, do we really want, you know, tens or hundreds of customers um, having to start from scratch to build their preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance use case, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so with these solutions accelerators, what we did was we said, well, you know, 60 or 
of a predictive maintenance machine learning use case is common, you know, regardless of um, regardless of where you implement it. And so we we created notebooks, literally coded notebooks that customers can download for free and install into their Databricks platform. You know, when they say, "Hey, I want to do predictive maintenance," or "Hey, I want to do demand forecasting," you know, we have that notebook. Download it, install it. It's like I said, 60 or 70 percent code complete, um, and then you know customers can do the the 30 or 40 percent of customization um, for their organization, and hopefully, um, hopefully get from idea into into production. Our our goal is six weeks. You know, our goal is that if you decide today that you want to do um, customer lifetime value model, um, our goal is that you should be able to have that. Um, in production in six weeks by leveraging these solutions accelerators. And so I'll kind of finish and hand back to you, Michael, and say, you know, for us, um, you know, the, the journey and data, the way to either start or or get momentum into that, um, into that program is to pick um, ideally one of these use cases that is important to your organization and, and represents significant value. Um, and then we'd love to work with you to get it into production in weeks. Um, Michael, I might hand back to you and let's, Hopefully, there's some questions coming through. Yeah, we have. Uh, that was really good. Thank you, Abid. I appreciate that. We have um, a number of questions coming through. We'll try to get to all of them. And uh, uh, we like to address uh, um, anyone who asks a question. We like to give them the courtesy of response, even if we kind of already talked about it. So the first question, and I'll leave it to you guys to decide who's going to answer it. Uh, first one is, uh, from a performance perspective, how can one overcome data bias and on going verification of um, algorithms from AI systems. Roshin, do you want to jump in on that one, mate? Oh, mate, this is all yours. Yeah. You basically said it in the structured streamings, but uh, I mean, that's one way to kind of look at that, right? I mean, you're constantly getting data in. You can do constant validation running. It's, it's highly performant, highly optimized. That's one way of actually doing it. Plus, the asset transactions that we have with the data platform kind of guarantees that the data is very binary and how you get it. It's going to succeed or it's going to fail, but there's, there's going to be good data coming through at some point. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. You know, the other thing, um, and at the risk of getting a little bit technical here, um, one of the capabilities we don't talk about too much in the platform is a technology called time travel, um, and it's part of it's part of our it's part of Delta. And what I love about time travel is, you know, when um, when your platform makes a decision, that decision is based on the algorithm that's in play at the time and the data that's in play at the time, right? And so. Um, this is, I think, particularly useful in sort of regulated or semi-regulated industries where you need to be able to say, you know, and, and I'll pick a retail example, right? You know, the major retailers in Australia need to be able to justify how they price their milk. It's a very topical conversation that hits the news about every three or four months, right? Um, and so with time travel, you know, there are data platforms, they're able to travel back to the exact point where they made the pricing change, look at the data that was available and be able to justify um, why their algorithm made a decision to change the way they price it. And so I think, you know, it's it's a little bit tangential, but I think having that ability to look at your models and go back in time and see how the models have changed and what data influenced that change um, has a key part to play in um, in overcoming bias and, and at least helping you manage the bias that might creep into your um, creep into your algorithms. That's, uh, that's uh, thank you for that. Uh, here's one that's very s specific, which you may or may not be able to get to. But somebody questions, what is? Um, can you elaborate on your um, uh, what you're doing with Ausnet? Um, and so I would absolutely. I would point. Um, I would point people to the Databricks website. So there's a there is a published case study um, that we worked with the folks at Ausnet to um, to get approval to to share with the the industry. And so that's. Um, that's on the website. Happy to share a link, but if you search for Databricks and Osnet, you will get a link very quickly um, that will go into a lot more detail than I possibly could here. That's good. Thank you for that. Uh, here's what uh, I find really interesting. I'm going to um, ask Ration if he wants to address this. Question is, uh, um, vegetation management in, is an interesting point, and we'll love to hear the data and solutions you provide for this. Yeah, that's a really good point, um, and it's quite an important point, especially in utilities, because of the how much vegetation can actually impact the infrastructure. So I would say a chainsaw might be the you know the old school way of solving it, but really you know we have to be we have to be environmentally conscious about what we're doing and where we work and, and what the impact is. So we've seen satellites actually you know collect the data. That's one way of actually collecting data. Drones using lidar is the other one, 
vegetation luckily does not grow at an incredibly rapid pace, so you can, it doesn't have to be you know, incredibly real-time data. What we found is actually the same technology we use for vegetation management, which is using drones for LIDAR and satellites for LIDAR, is also used for things like trying to capture nefarious activities and utilities, because not everyone behaves collaboratively. People sometimes siphon power. So when they use the same technology, they can detect little anomalous pieces of equipment on the transformers, and they can then react to them uh, to make this thing. But yeah, uh, drones, satellites collecting data, and then looking at the, at the vegetation growth is one way. But also, maybe we can make decisions as to how we can manage the vegetation itself, so we don't have to, we can build infrastructure around it. So especially with vegetation that, you know, is necessary for maybe, um, uh, you know, a part of the crop circle, or it's part of, you know, some more sustainable environment, you can potentially build infrastructure that allows vegetation to still grow, but has less impact on the equipment. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I have a question. Uh, which I think you may have touched on already, but um, one of the most often spoken about, uh, uh, you, well, you referred to demand management earlier. How does all of the, how does this platform, how can you apply this to the uh, demand response? Um, particularly, I suppose, as it relates to large energy uh, users. Uh, I can take a run at Roshan and then I'm sure you can get more detail. But look, you know, I think if, I think, at a, at a super high level, what we're trying to do is make better decisions, more accurate decisions, more real time, right? And so, if we're talking about um, if we're talking about forecasting demand to leverage it against production, then then clearly the more granular and the more accurate our predictions about future demand can be, then the more accurate our decisions about current production can be. And so, I you know I think that's a and Rashin, you'll jump in, but that's a like that. That is a super common bread and butter use case for customers that they solve on Databricks, and it's just yeah. about it's it's about making better decisions in real time. And so that might be better decisions because you've got more accurate predictions because you're using better models. It might be better decisions because you're integrating alternate data. I think alternate data is one of the you know biggest opportunities to improve our decision making. You know, bring in obviously the data from our plant. But bring in weather data, you know, bring in social data, bring in um, whatever alternate sources of data we can source um, to to look at where we think where we think demand is going to be, you know, at the end of our production cycle. I don't know, Roshan, if you want to jump you in. You know, that's 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 absolutely right. So you know, especially especially as like when there's um, unforeseen circumstances, which is usually when demand kind of like peaks, uh, extreme heat, extreme cold. You know, especially living in Texas, we've gone through. Last year was a horrendous year, and the grid all, was almost catastrophically destroyed because they weren't able to manage that. So they went into, uh, you know, load shedding, and there, there was severe consequences of shutting it down. This year it wasn't as bad, but you know, kind of having this information to make predictions on extreme weather and where you can ramp up production or decrease production is is important. But and another one is actually what do you do in the plant itself, like during these high kind of peaks. Um, how do we keep the employees, and this is an actual use case, how do we keep the employees informed to make those kind of decisions? Uh, and one is around natural language uh, processing, NLP, and recommendation engines. So what we're seeing is, I mean this like respectfully, is that you know, the energy industry itself is also, people are, are retiring and uh, recruiting new employees into it is, is getting challenging, but there's a, there's a vast gap in the knowledge about who really understands the, the nature of these beasts, these machinery, uh, these, these equipment. So if, when people look, just look at anomalous spikes, it could be an overreaction to maybe shut down that piece of plant to prevent a catastrophic accident. But actually, you know, a more seasoned engineer would say, well, actually that's just how it behaves and it's perfectly within you know, tolerance. So we need to build these kind of like recommendation engines that say, it's okay, these are the potential consequences. That's just, you know, part of how the machine operates under these circumstances, uh, you know, and then you can then make a decision based on that. So this is also important. It's like, how do we manage that demand even on the internal uh, consumption level? Here's a, a very straightforward question. I'll throw it out. Either one of you can grab it. Um, how would you gauge if a prospective project is financially viable? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and so I might, I might jump. I love, this is one of my sort of pet topics, so um, I'll try not to take the rest of the hour um, just talking about this one. But um, like, I, th I think it's a super important question, and the very fact that um, the very fact that who, the person who's asked it is thinking about it is a really good sign for their data strategy, right? You know, we um, 
all too all too often the decision about which projects get um, get resources allocated to them, and because most like almost every company I talk to has a laundry list of projects that they'd love love to leverage machine learning and AI for, and they can't possibly get to all of them. Often the one that they pick is the one that their data teams are most personally interested in, right? And so, you know, but but even beyond that, we're making decisions about. We'll pick the use cases where we've got the easiest access to data or we'll pick the use cases where um, we've got you know interest in the data teams um, all too infrequently do customers actually um, or do organizations sort of measure the potential business outcome right and so this is kind of weird databricks we're a technology provider right we provide a platform but we've actually built a um, we call them a business value team uh, even here in australia we've got uh, a couple of members in that team based here locally who work with our customers to come in and say, well, okay, it's great that we've got this use case, but how do we quantify the business, the projected or potential business value of that use case? And so um, we've even got as far as with some of our more sophisticated customers is to develop a score sheet of, you know, five or eight different metrics by which they assess a, um, you know, whether a, pro whether a project is viable. And, you know, obviously there's technical and security elements of that assessment, but then there's, you know, what is the measurable business value? Um, because again, you know, back to the point I was making um, a little while ago is, particularly with your early use cases in machine learning and AI, you really, as an organization, you really need to pick use cases that are gonna have a measurable reportable impact because if you can get momentum in your data strategy from those early use cases that will carry you forward you know way quicker it's um, it's super important and so I guess that's sorry if I've rambled a little bit there but it's a it's a pet topic and I think the answer is you need to really have the discipline of forcing yourself to sit down work with the business um, do a lot of what if and why not scenarios and um, and come up with a projection of what you think the business value of that um, particular project is and, and then document it and come back and revisit it after you've deployed the project and you know we won't always be right but if you're going through that process um, I will be highly confident that you've got a better chance of um, of picking the projects that are that are going to deliver the biggest outcome I'll pause <laughs> that, that was great B. and I love the very first uh, part of your answer the, the very fact that they're asking the question means they're on the right track um, <laughs> right. well said Here's what I'm going to I'm going to uh, throw to uh, Ration. Uh, it's a, it, a bit long, so I'm going to read it slowly. As a solutions provider, I know there have been challenges on introducing this technology in its early stages to users slash customers. What do you suggest we can do uh, to fast track or create more value to this system, especially to developing countries? Yeah, thank you. In fact, the reason I kind of pinged that question was was one a I actually grew up in in South Africa. So I'm familiar with challenges in developing countries to get infrastructure and technology. And two, it's pretty much related to what B just spoke about as to like, how do you judge value and how do you judge something that's financially viable? And I think what's interesting about that question, that's a great question is, um, where do we start? Right? And it's easy when you, when you have all the bells and whistles and all the platforms and you know, like in North America, you have multiple clouds and platform and infrastructure is relatively cheap to set up and you have, access to so much technology you can you know but the, it's the same thing is is to sort of look at the customers and what the demand is in that specific area don't don't think yes of course we want to solve large problems but think very very locally about what is that what will gain value for your specific customers what are their challenges and what you may find is it's really it's around most customers will say i want to reduce cost but actually what they really want is a more sustainable flow of energy if that's what it is and they'll maintain paying that price if that's what they get in uh if there's a disruption to flow and the cost goes up then that's you know not something that they want to look into so that could be one thing is to manage the infrastructure just maintain stability in that infrastructure that's one two is reduce cost and reduce uh health and safety uh incidences associated to that right so we want to reduce risk and we want to reduce equipment from having incidences we also want to reduce risk at home um, and this is really where we could start target target health and safety as one of them and then also target just stability of infrastructure. And the third one could be around pricing and cost. I think that comes later on. With a stable infrastructure and a scalable platform for data science, you can then reduce costs later on. That's my that's my, my best guess as to where to start. Good. Uh, we Guys, we have about two minutes left. So I'm going to send you, I'm going to ask you both to comment on questions that's asking for deeper insights with uh, two minutes to go. <laughs> so what do you believe, in the, what are your deeper insights on how we can improve this system 
overall? <laughs> that is a broad question. Um, <laughs> what, what is the system itself? Is the system like the data infrastructure platform itself? Well, it's, I mean, consider using Databricks. I mean, you know, use our open source version or use our commercial version. Either way, yes. Perfectly Ration, you, told me, you told me you weren't going to do any sales pitching. Well, then use our open source version. And then... Right, right. But, you, right. you know, I might, I, I might jump in there and say more or less the same thing. But, um, but the truth is, I think, you know, most organizations today are maintaining lots of different data environments. They've got a mixture of data warehouses and, and data lakes. Um, you know, we really passionately were opinionated about Lakehouse being, you know, the, the right answer and, and the way that a modern data architecture should be built because it starts with a single source of truth that allows you to leverage all of your data, you know, leverage all of your data for data science, but also leverage all of your data um, for business analytics and, um, and start with a, a platform um, that is known instead, you know, we've all sat in those meetings where, you know, one person will say, well, this is what my data says. And then the other person will say, well, actually, this is what my data says, and it's the complete opposite. And that's the end of the productive conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think if we can start by um, start by building a platform that delivers a single source of truth and get momentum in your um, data strategy by delivering quick, measurable wins. Um, like, we'd love, whoever asked that question or any of the other questions, we'd love to have a one-on-one a -on -one conversation about yeah, your environment, absolutely. but at, at, at a super high level, that would be my answer. Mine would be, uh, if you had to pick one, I would say be open. So consider an open uh, platform strategy. The reason is don't lock yourself in. Whatever direction you choose later on, you know, it, it doesn't have to be Databricks. You know, it can scale up and scale down, whatever you choose to. If you choose a proprietary data uh, lock-in, then that will be the decision you make down the road, and it can be very, very costly uh, later down. So have an open data format. Uh, and allow uh, vendors to work with you, allow um, ISCs to work with you, and be collaborative. That would be my strategies. Go with openness at the, from the very beginning. And openness does not mean less secure. That's something to also be considering. So an open technology does not mean you're insecure, I mean, you're less secure, you're open to attack. It just means that you're using open standards and you have an open format of your data. Well, I think uh, that we're out of time. Uh, um... Abid, uh, Reshin, this has a, just been a terrific conversation, very informative, as you can tell by the number of questions. There's a, a number we didn't get to, and as um, Abid said, uh, feel free to contact uh, either Bead or Reshin uh, directly, um, and they'll get to the questions um, you, you, we didn't get to. And if you have any additional questions, please do that. So I want to thank um, both of our speakers. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I'd like to thank our audience. Um, and I'd like to remind everybody that in uh, what about five weeks time, we're going to go back live with uh, Inlet Australia in Melbourne on March 16th and 17th. Of course, Databricks is a major sponsor and participant in the event. Uh, as I said earlier, one of the first live events uh, in Australia in what, two and a half, almost three years uh, in this industry, and we're very excited. We've got a number of great speakers. Go to the website, inlitaustralia.com, and you'll, you'll get a sense of uh, the type of content we'll be uh, providing. And we expect it to be a really lively and exciting uh, network event with a lot of top-notch uh, executives and a lot of top-notch solutions uh, on display. So again, everybody, thank you. Thank you, B. Thank you, Ration. Uh, everyone have a great day, and look forward to seeing you in Melbourne in March. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Good, Michael. Thanks, Michael.